nostalgia. If I could describe Sandland the series with one single word, it would be nostalgia. <laughs> yes, this series just absolutely oozes Akira Toriyama. And unfortunately, with his passing away right before this series came out, I needed something like this. I was honestly planning on going and getting the entire Dragon Ball manga series and reading through that. And after watching like the first eight episodes of this series, I got that. <laughs> it really does feel like Sandland the series is pretty much like if you took the OG Dragon Ball and then you threw in like Dragon Quest monsters and demons, that's what you get. <laughs> and with my nostalgic glasses on, I'm just eating it up. Now at the same time, I can sort of see from outsider's perspective without the nostalgic glasses, this series might not have enough to offer, but at the same time, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. But after watching the first eight episodes, I'm here to give my first impressions. I know, first impressions, but hey, they dropped like six episodes of it immediately because the six episodes was based on a movie. <laughs> so I do have like a big jump. It's, this is like a mid-season review, really, technically, but let's just jump into my thoughts on the series. Opening up Sandland, we jump into Sandland, this area that is just completely decimated by war. Everything's dried up. It's just a desert wasteland. And unfortunately, the king of Sandland is pretty much holding all of the water sources of the people hostage, and he's selling it for insane prices. And so Sheriff Rao, who is actually the sheriff of this one village, has made a promise to his people to find a water source. Now, Rao has a lead because he notices a bird that actually typically migrates to areas with water sources. So he knows there's a water source nearby, but he doesn't trust the king. So the only people that he can turn to for assistance in trying to find this water source is the demons of the land. Now, there's not a very good relationship between the humans and the demons. The demons are often seen as, as evil, uh, dangerous, and there's a lot of false stories hedged upon them that the people themselves discriminate against them. Even still, he offers a mutual agreement with them that, if, hey, if we can find this water source, it'll be beneficial to both of us. Well, the leader, Lucifer, is amused by this and decides to help him, offering his son, Beelzebub, to assist him. So Rao and Beelzebub, along with Beelzebub's assistant, Thief, go on an adventure to try to find this water source. Very quickly, they end up breaking down. They find a tank nearby that they steal. <laughs> And then they end up on the run from the king himself because the military notes that they took their tank. But additionally, the king himself and the general Zhao are not too happy about the idea that there's a possibility that Rao himself can discover the secret behind what they're doing with the water sources. Underlying this whole story is the history of Rao, his involvement with the military itself, this one catastrophe that happened many, many years ago, and yes, a lot of the falsities that the empire itself has sort of created to hide the truth about what's happened in the past. Like I mentioned earlier, the first six episodes is one story arc. It's based off the movie. It's kind of around the idea of them trying to find a water source. Going into seven and beyond, up to episode 13, that's a second story arc that kind of involves a different kingdom. So my thoughts on Sandland, the series, like I said before, I fully admit it. I have some Akira Toriyama nostalgia glasses going on full throttle right now. <laughs> I absolutely love the style and feel of this show. It just has that nostalgic vibe of a group of people getting into a car to a car or a tank and just traveling around this desolate wasteland and all the goofy characters they end up running into. First of all, the visual style. Yes, I am not a huge fan of CGI. I do like CGI when it is pure CGI. Like that's all they use. Just go full force into it. Don't do this kind of back and forth. Now, I will admit that's the unfortunate thing about the series so far is that they do that kind of back and forth with the CGI and 2D art. So pretty much if a character is a mainstay in the series, like they're around all the time, they will produce a CGI model for them and they use it all the time, which I think look great. I, I do like the look of Beelzebub. They do a really great style with him. Even his kind of spiky hair and the horns, it all looks really good. It's got a texture to it. I think everything has a good little filter and texture to it to kind of make it look 2D style. And it just absolutely captures Akira Toriyama style. But then you have him going into a town or something like that. And then suddenly there's a whole bunch of 2D art characters that don't match the roundness of the character themselves, the main characters. And that's where it kind of bugs me. But even still, that's kind of, few and far between. <laughs> For the most part, they keep it to this one style that again, like I said, has a great texture to it. It's got a good aesthetic to it. The cell shadedness look to it, it looks 2D. Then add to that the 2D environments and whatnot the characters are in, a lot of the smoke effects and everything, the tank riding around in the desert, all that really looks good. I think they did a fantastic job on it. There was like maybe one environmental thing where I think it looked a little bit off and that was this massive sandstorm. But other than that, I think visually it looks really appealing. I think they pulled off something really fantastic with the series. And like I said earlier, yes, 
all the characters themselves are just, they ooze Akira Toriyama style. I just love the Dragon Quest style to all the monsters and the demons. You got that kind of aesthetic to all the other characters that really matches like Dragon Ball and stuff like that. I, I think overall, it just, it looks great. Akira Toriyama just had a very unique style to him. And I think the aesthetic itself, like I said before, sort of just kind of likens itself to the OG Dragon Ball. I do admit there's a bit of a nostalgia that kind of makes the characters sort of fit into certain other characters from Dragon Ball. Like, oh yeah, On's obviously the Bulma. Beelzebub is Goku. <laughs> yeah, General Zhao is definitely Frieza. <laughs> General Zhao is definitely Frieza. He's got this cult kind of orb that he's flying around in. <laughs> it's definitely Frieza. It, it, do, it does kind of lend itself to that. But again, that nostalgic charm sort of does kind of dampen it for me to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'll take it. I do like the variety to the action scenes themselves. There's a lot of them that kind of just is them in the tank fighting another target and a lot of like cleverness to, okay, got to get out of the tank and lift it up so they can shoot upwards. Uh, you have like this whole like girls on Panzer segment where they're going through all these pillars and trying to flank each other. That kind of is a lot of fun. A lot of the use of Beelzebub himself, which is extremely OP, is kind of kept to a wrap. Like they don't overutilize him, even though he is extremely powerful. And he does have that kind of childish arrogance to him. So he's not very useful most of the time. But yeah, I do feel like a lot of the physical combat segments where a character is fighting each other is sort of kind of, for the most part, kept to Beelzebub kind of dashing towards somebody and then like a slow motion hit of them and then you know, dash the next one, slow motion hit. So it's not like a lot of like choreography to the fights themselves, which is a little bit of a letdown. But the later fight in like the fifth or sixth episode was was decently put together. And you got that little feeling of almost a, I don't know, a Dragon Ball charge up moment, which was kind of epic. But overall, the action scenes themselves are really well put together. They're entertaining and variety in a lot of ways. Jumping into the story itself, this is where I feel like my nostalgic glasses can kind of cause problems <laughs> because it's one of those series where when I kind of take a little bit of a step back, I, I sort of realize there's some shortcomings with the series. Well, now let's kind of focus in on that first arc, the Demon Prince arc, which is the first six episodes that is the movie. This is what they kind of adapted from the manga. Everything beyond that is stuff that apparently was not put into a manga form, but it was wrote by Akira Toriyama. He did all the designs. He did the writing. He just didn't make a manga yet. But let's focus on that first six episode because that is a very complete story arc. I will admit the first three episodes really does feel like just shenanigans. There's not really anything of like real substance here. And it's something that I can see kind of drags out for a lot of people. There is charm that definitely carries the first half of that arc. And that is really in Beelzebub's character, Sheriff Rao and Thief, their chemistry with each other. Beelzebub himself is a dork. <laughs> he is a 2,500 year old demon dork. He's a kid. He has like very little experience. It kind of insinuates that he spends most all of his time playing video games. He doesn't really get out. He doesn't know much about the world itself. He's very cocky. He's very full of himself, which he has a right to because demons in this world and seemingly Beelzebub himself specifically is extremely powerful. This is a guy that can get impaled, beat around and nothing really hurts him. He's just kind of seemingly invincible. And we don't really get too much of him actually getting to do stuff. Most of his interaction with people and fighting is just slapping people. <laughs> there, is, there is a kind of childishness to the story and the idea that most everybody doesn't want to harm people. So Sheriff, even though he has a gun, he doesn't use it. He just want, gets his batons out. With Beelzebub, yeah, he steals water. He attacks caravans from the military. He fights people but he's literally going around slapping people. <laughs> he just slaps everybody until they give up. So if you have this whole situation where ne they nearly die, he'll chase down the bad guys and slap them <laughs> and then leave them. <laughs> like I got my slap in, I'm good, I'll walk away. It does have kind of a very childish juvenile style to it that again, like I said before, very charming. But Beelzebub himself is a very fun character. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that he thinks he's super diabolical. And when you ask him why he's diabolical, it's always these stupid things like, you know, it would be like, I don't flush the toilet or I, I don't wash my hands for weeks on end. That's how evil I am. It's got that whole kind of goofy thing going for it, which is, again, like I said before, very fun and charming. Thief is his assistant, which is kind of the old fart that doesn't want to do anything. He's lazy, but he can't ever talk back to Beelzebub. And then Rao is a very kind of straightforward individual that 
he sort of is sort of your grumpy old man, but he's a good guy. Like inside, he's just pure justice. He's a guy that knows when the wrongdoing is happening and he's trying to fix it. He's got kind of that grumpy look to him, but he's got that experience in combat and that going alongside the other two works really well. But of course, a lot of the character developments and a lot of build in the story itself is centered around Rao. And that's where we get into that second half of this first arc. That's where we get into his backstory, his regrets, something that he didn't have full understanding of and that driving him forward into to a redemption story. See, underlying this whole story is about discrimination and the lies that the kingdom itself tells and that how that kind of all drives them to believe a false history. And a lot of that being around the Peachy tribe, this tribe that was trying to do good for the area, but ultimately led to destruction. Sheriff Rao is a very well-known person that people respect greatly. And you can see that in the other characters and how they respond to his presence in this story. But like I said earlier, that all leads into a a pretty significant kind of redemption story. And again, kind of looking beyond discrimination that people have. Now, moving beyond the first six episodes into the second story arc, the Angelic Heroes arc, this is where I have both my excitement, but my fears. Whereas the first six episode really does feel like a one and done. Like a Kira Toriyama just made this very quick story. It's very quick. You get to the climax. It's completed. You can wrap it up at that point and the story's done. Going on beyond that, going seven and beyond, that's where we get into this additional story that Akira Toriyama was writing, where I really do feel like the story itself and the world itself is expanding insanely. And why that makes me kind of hesitant going into the second arc is I feel like this is sort of where he wanted to go with the grander story of Sandland that unfortunately I don't know if they'll ever complete. What I mean by that is that Sandland itself, the first six episodes is very compressed in this one area and it's got the demons and the humans and that's it. Whereas when we get into that second story arc, we're kind of expanding into the angels, we're expanding into other countries, we're really taking the story and we're broadening it. This is where it does feel like you're going from like the original Dragon Ball where it kind of feels very isolated and you're going into the later series where we're starting to expand the characters and expanding the universe itself. Now, obviously, we still have like five more episodes, so we could have a good wrap-up point, but this is where I'm starting to, I'm getting my teeth into this story in this world, and I'm starting to want more. And again, like I said earlier, I don't know there's going to be really much more beyond this next arc. I know that Akira Toriyama pins the second half, but I'm not sure if he pinned beyond then. What I mean to say is that episode seven and beyond is where I'm starting to really get into the story. I'm really getting invested in the characters. I like the the world that it's building and I just really hope that there's a, a really solid payoff at the very end of the tunnel and they don't feel like this is a very brief moment in a very epic story. To equate it to Dragon Ball, it would be like watching the original Dragon Ball series would be the first six episodes, and then you start watching the first few episodes of Dragon Ball Z, and then suddenly it's done. <laughs> it's like you know that there's an insane story that Akira Toriyama has that we're just never going to get. But again, that's me just assuming there might be an expanded story here, and in actuality, the 13 episodes might be a nice wrap-up. But that's all for me to really say that the story is really going somewhere that I'm really interested in. All that said, if you're a fan of Akira Toriyama, please, please go watch Sandland. It is just, it oozes Akira Toriyama. It's got the style of it, the very unique character designs themselves, the aesthetic to it, the feel of it. It's a fun little adventure kind of traveling around, trying to find the answers of the world itself. Again, getting into a lot about discrimination, uh, falsities of history itself, and how people can kind of perceive things the incorrect way. Still having the charm of these three characters, just having fun, Bill's above and his childish nature that just I get a huge kick out of. All kind of building into a second story arc that I think is going to be hopefully extremely fulfilling. Yes, it does have the CGI look to it, but again, it has a great kind of cell shaded style to it that they very much so have kind of perfected at this point. But anyhow, that's my thoughts on Sandland. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to that like button down below. Comment. Let me know what you think of the series so far. Additionally, if you're new to the channel, make sure that subscribe button to get my content. I do news reviews, first impressions, top list if it's anime, it's pretty much here. Additionally, if you like this content and you want to support the channel more, at Patreon link, tips link, so thanks for membership button down below. Greatly appreciate if it does. And y'all take care.